YouTube here, and welcome back to my corner of the internet. I'm Shannon, and today I've got another book talk video to share with you guys, a Christmas book talk video. And today we're talking about Christmas on the Island by Jenny Colgan. Around this time last year, I did another book talk on this author, and it was a book called Christmas at the Little Beach Street Bakery. And that was fun. It was a fun, easy Christmas read. This was the same, although I will say I enjoyed this one a lot more than the other one um, for no other reason than it was just a story that I found more interesting. The writing's about the same and um, I think Jenny's a good storyteller and I will wholeheartedly say that I enjoyed this one much more than two book talks ago when we talked about Home for Christmas by Holly Chamberlain. Um, so let's get to some pros and some cons before we get into the meat of the story. For prose, I would say it's a well-written, well-developed story that made me care about the characters. For cons, however, I have two major ones, two, and they're big. Number one, this is the third book in a series, but not related to the book I read last year, a completely different series. From what I can tell, this woman, Jenny, she is a machine when it comes to putting out books. She's put out a ton. <laughs> and this book does have a pretty high rating on Goodreads. It's over four stars. But so yeah, this was book three in a series, but nowhere, nowhere does it tell you that. Not on the front, not on the back, nowhere. There's nowhere. <laughs> so I just, I don't know what the point of that was to not at least give us a heads up. I will say though, you can read it as a standalone story, but I feel like I would have cared a bit more deeply for some of the characters if I had, if this was my third time visiting with them on the island of Muir. So that was a bit like, what? And the only way that I found this out was because I went to Goodreads, because I kind of felt like we were missing a bit of backstory for these people. And that's when I found out that this was book three. However, like I said, it, it, it works fine as a standalone. I think especially if you're going into it knowing it does work as a standalone, but that there are two other books, it'll make the things that kind of make you scratch your head make more sense. My second gripe with this, and this really isn't with Jenny in particular, it's more with the publisher. And that is, there are so many, <laughs> typos there's so many typos and I get it like this to me that's this that's not on Jenny you know you write your drafts you do the best you can to find the mistakes that you can but you know your eyes get very used to looking at something when it's read it over and over again and so sometimes mistakes slip by you it's completely understandable but I feel like there should have been editors at the publishers who should have caught so many of these mistakes because they're all such silly mistakes. And it's not with spelling, it's with um, sentence structure and grammar. Like, you'll know that what she's trying to say is, Joel put his hand on her arm. But what it'll say is, Joel put his hand on his arm. You know, just little mistakes like that, and there's so many of them. And every time I'd hit one, it would take me out of the story for a minute. You know what I mean? So, um, Again, not Jenny's fault, but I feel like that was a big one. Because even if you're self-publishing, which this isn't, this was published by a publishing house. But even if you're self-publishing, something that's become very popular these days, something that I feel is very intriguing because you get full creative control, you hire an editor to find all the mistakes that you've no doubt missed. Because as I'm writing my book, I know that I'm not the world's best editor, so whether I go traditional publishing or self-published, I'm gonna make sure that a ton of eyes have searched for any mistakes because this is my worst nightmare, this many mistakes. Okay, so, so now that we've got that out of our systems, let's talk a bit about the story. Like I said, it was a fun holiday read. I had no problems with the story itself. This story takes place on what I believe to be a fictitious Scottish island. And um, it's called Muir, and we meet all these colorful characters there. Kind of the main character is a woman named Flora. She works at a, um, or she owns like a 
restaurant on this island that's very popular with the locals. She um, She's with a man named Joel. Um, Joel, from what we can gather, is he's a kind, loving man and he cares for her a lot, but he carries with him a lot of emotional baggage left over from a very rocky childhood. Now again, I would assume this is something we would know more if we had read the first two books in the series. But you still do pick it up from this story. Um, and also, from what I can gather, she finds out she's pregnant at the end of book two. So now we're going into it, she's pregnant and she's worried. She doesn't really want to have to tell Joel. <laughs> He's the father, of course, but She's worried that it's going to send him running for the hills because he's just, he's a damaged man. And because so many of his problems stem from his childhood, she feels that maybe becoming a dad is something that's going to be really terrifying for him. And she's right. <laughs> so she puts off telling him for as long as possible. Um, she tells some other people. She tells the local doctor, a man named Safe and she tells her friend Lorna and she also tells so there's this other couple we meet their names are Colton and Finton now Finton is Flora's brother and Colton is Finton's life partner and he's very wealthy he lives in this mansion um, but he's dying of cancer currently and when we meet him in this book I'm guessing he was diagnosed in an earlier book and now he's kind of bedridden and his time is coming very soon. So one time while Flora is there visiting him when they're alone, she tells him that she's pregnant. Um, he can't even really respond at this point. So she feels it's a safe bet to be able to tell him. So he'll be able to just know it. And you know, she, she just wants him to know before he goes. The whole scenario with Fenton and Colton dying is one of those things where I mentioned at the beginning where I feel like I would have cared a lot more deeply for these characters if I had read the first two books. Like Colton being sick and dying is, you know, it still touches you, but I don't really know anything about him. Um, so I, yeah, I think that's one, definitely one of the things that where you would have benefited from reading the first two books. So Joel is a lawyer. He's out of town. He comes home. Um, he goes up to the mansion where Colton and Fenton live and he's um, kind of dealing with them a little bit because one thing that's happened is Colton has been estranged from his family for many, many years. They're American and um, Joel is also American. <laughs> There's a lot of people. It's so Joel and Colton are American. They both live on Muir now. Like I said, Colton had been estranged from his family for many years because when he came out as gay, his father pretty much disowned him. And now as years have passed, his parents are getting very up there in age. His mother is very soon, and his father as well, are going to be needing um, sort of extra care. They're going to be going into a home, and um, Colton doesn't really know any of this because he's not keeping up with them, but his brother Tripp decides to come and find Colton and tell him, you're very wealthy. It's, it's time for you to monetarily take care of your parents in their twilight years, as it were. So Tripp arrives on the island and he doesn't know that Colton is sick. Um, so he goes looking for him, he finds him, he goes up to the house and even though Colton had been bedridden for, you know, a while now, the arrival of Tripp renews him with a new energy and that energy is fueled by rage. <laughs> And um, Fenton, Colton's partner, is in some ways happy for it because he feels like even if just for a little bit longer, he's gotten his, you know, his love back. There's, there's some fire, there's some life in Colton again. So Tripp's not making any friends as he's sort of just barreling around this island. <laughs> Um, just saying the first thing that comes to his head, being very homophobic, things like that. Uh, so eventually he, you know, him and Colton talk and Tripp's very taken aback to see how sick Colton is. He had no idea. Um, and, you know, Colton's kind of like, you are not getting a penny of my money. None of you are. So you can just get out of here now. 
So Trip leaves, but he doesn't leave town. He decides that, you know, seeing his brother kind of triggered some old feelings in him, and he kind of decides, you know, if Colton's this sick, I'm going to hang around and maybe try to be with him towards the end. Because while Trip's really obnoxious and really unlikable at first, as you get to know him a bit more, you kind of warm up to him a little bit. So that's what's going on on that side. So at one point, Joel goes up there to talk to Colton kind of about his will, what can be done, how to make sure these people that he doesn't want to get his money don't get his money. Um, and as Joel is leaving after the meeting with Colton, Colton says, congrats on the baby. And Joel's kind of like, what baby? And then he leaves because he's, it's, you know, all the pieces are coming together. And he is livid. So he goes home. He sort of confronts Flora. There's a big blow up. And um, he leaves. And she's understandably very upset. But, but the one thing that kind of shook me was at one point he's wondering. He's like, how long has Colton known? And she's like, oh, I don't know three weeks or something like that. He's like, three weeks? And he's like, well, how long have you known? And she says something like 11 weeks. So she's known all this time and she, she just hasn't told him. <laughs> so yeah, he leaves, he's furious, and she is understandably very upset. While all of this is going on, there's another storyline that's playing out. And that's the one of Safe, the doctor that I mentioned earlier. He's a Syrian refugee and he has two sons. His wife is kind of presumed dead, kind of just missing. They don't know. Um, but he's here, he's been relocated, and he's restarted his life with his children. And this is their first Christmas. And so they're all a little confused about what's going on and how it all goes. And then there's a bit of a side story with Safe and Flora's best friend, Lorna, who is a teacher at the school where Safe's children go to school and um, a bit of a romance starts up there between the two of them, which is um, just riddled with a ton of guilt on Safe's part because he loves his wife very much, but it's been years since he's seen her and, you know, for all intents and purposes, she can be presumed dead. So it kind of raises the question like, how long do you wait for someone who might be dead, who you might never get confirmation of whether they are dead, you know? How long do you wait? And the thing that was most upsetting to the both of them really was, it wasn't just like they wanted to have a fling, they were developing feelings, deep feelings for each other. I'm not entirely sure what the timeline is on this book, like how much time passes, but I feel like it's not very much. I feel like a, a few days maybe? A few weeks? I honestly don't know, but yeah, it doesn't seem like much time passes. So that there kind of sets up all the storylines for anyone who kind of was wondering if they wanted to read it. That'll kind of give you the enough info that if you do, you can carry it on. There's still a ton of story left. Um, but if you want the spoilers, <laughs> keep on watching. What eventually happens is one night there is a big, terrible storm on the island. Colton is dying. He's going to be gone this night. Um, so everyone kind of goes there to say their goodbyes, Trip included. When Trip walks in, Colton has, throughout the course of the book, kind of warmed up to the idea of him being there. Trip has this idea that he would like to try to FaceTime their mother to kind of give her a bit of closure as to whatever happened to her son Colton. So Colton agrees, um, the connection's made and she gets to see him and that's a very emotional part of the book. For me that was probably the one part. That that jerked a couple of tears from me. Her seeing him, recognizing him, and then saying goodbye. Even though they didn't go so far as to tell her that Colton was dying because she's very old and, um, you know, they didn't want to put that shock on her and that grief on her. But instead, you know, they just say goodbye and they tell each other they love each other and that kind of ends beautifully. After that, Colton says to Trip, um, I'm going to do a very quick last minute um, amendment on my will. And Tripp says, you know, no, no, we, we don't need your money, Colton. You know, that might have been why I came here, but that's not why I'm still here. And Colton says, no, 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 none for you. <laughs> but for mom and dad, I want them taken care of. 
Um, then as the night goes on, the doctor comes to give him the pain medicine. And as is often with the case, you know, there's a final dose of morphine that that puts you, you know, that carries you over to the other side. Um, and so Safe kind of knew that this was going to be that dose for Colton. And there's a scene where it's very sad where Fenton says, because, um, you know, as the cancer gets worse and worse, you need more and more morphine to dull the pain enough that the patient is comfortable. So Fenton asks the doctor, he says, is the morphine going to kill him? And the doctor says, no, the cancer is going to kill him. This is going to make sure that it doesn't hurt so much. Um, and that scene really touched me. Um, it's just a very, you know, emotional, emotional scene. So that's kind of what's going on at the house. As Joel is there, because Joel's his lawyer, so he's there to amend the will. Um, once it all happens, Joel is given a sort of jolt of realization that life is too short to be an idiot <laughs> and he's going to go down to the restaurant and tell Flora that he's sorry that he loves her and that yes he wants he wants this baby with her as he's leaving he gets a call from his friend who had been walking by the restaurant and saw Flora laying on the floor so him and the doctor they leave and they go and they see how Flora's doing. The doctor's kind of like, okay, well, she passed out. Um, and Joel is kind of panicky. He's like, we need to call the helicopter ambulance. And the doctor's like, listen, if we call the helicopter ambulance just because she passed out, they're going to be very upset. Like, let me look at her. So he does an exam and he decides that um, she's having a miscarriage. And she is heartbroken when she gets that news. And so is Joel. And Joel's trying to tell her, like, I'm so sorry, all of this stuff. And she's getting irritated because for however long the book is, that's how long he's been ignoring her. So whether it's a few days or a few weeks or whatever it is, like, you don't do that to a pregnant woman. Um, and she's like, listen, Joel, glad you had your epiphany, but this isn't about you. I'm potentially miscarrying right now. Um, and he's like, okay, so then he kind of shuts up. But, um... In the end, she's able to keep the baby. She doesn't miscarry, much to everyone's delight. And then the book kind of ends on Christmas Day and they're all having dinner together, trip included. He stayed and had dinner with everyone at Flora and Fenton's family farm kind of place <laughs> where their dad is and just the whole family's there. And it's just a nice, sweet ending. I'm assuming there could be a book four because, you know, it's set up floors pregnant. Um, maybe Trip will become a character in this series. Maybe he'll stay on in Scotland. Who knows? But um, yeah, it's a sweet story. It's got some dark, heavier topics mixed in to this Christmas story. You know, like uh, death for one. Um, immigration for another. Um, the possibility of miscarriage you know there's so my problem with home for christmas by holly chamberlain that we read was that it was too fluffy so for this one it does get a little heavier which i do like and i mean that cover is so it's just beautiful i think um so yeah but again the two cons are it is book three in a series which it doesn't tell you and like i keep i keep looking to see if I'm crazy and I've just missed it. But no, it doesn't say anything about it being a part of a series. That and there's a ton of grammatical errors. But honestly, I could put it aside. The errors were such that I knew what she was trying to say. She just wasn't saying it properly. So I'd say all in all, if you're looking for a fun Christmas read that isn't quite as cheesy as some other Christmas books tend to be, I would definitely recommend Christmas on the Island. The book that I'm reading now for next week is called After the Snow and I think you guys are really gonna love that one too because it's kind of a, a mystery. So that's fun. Anyway you guys thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video and I will see you tomorrow with another day of Vlogmas. Bye guys!